All right, y'all, let's get going with some of the uh, lecture for the course. Um, so you can expect around an hour long uh, lecture every week that is, um, you know, a, a further explanation, further communication, um, under hopefully clarification, understanding about the readings and the supplementary materials that you are taking in throughout your time. So as you know, uh, from hopefully you have reviewed the introductory uh, video that I have put up for you, I, I really encourage you to do that. Um, if you haven't, um, that goes over the syllabus, seeing what readings that you have. Also, you'll be watching some videos, you'll be uh, reading various articles. So there's, I'm trying to also give you a diversity of um, kind of media for you to learn about this. So let's get into it, an introduction to the use and applications of psychedelics. So I do want to equip you with some definitions um, because you'll be You'll be hearing all of these, uh, not only throughout the course, but also in conversation um, about psychedelics, hallucinogens, entheogens, psychoactive uh, substances, psychotropic medications. Um, they are all very similar, but they are um, they are different. So let's let's get into it. So hallucinogens are compounds that cause distinct changes in perception, emotional state of mind, and awareness of space and time. These are medically defined as sensory delusions. Um, so in a, a hallucinogen potentiates hallucinations. Uh, psychedelics, this is a type of drug, a type of substance that exerts its effects primarily on serotonin. Um, so we're going to be talking a lot about uh, the serotonin system um, and uh, I'll be talking a little bit about agonists and antagonists. So you can see here, a psychedelic is a drug that it exerts its effects primarily on serotonin. Um, these are serotonin 2A receptors, and they they um, work as an agonist, which means that it's a drug that binds to the receptor, producing a similar response to the intended chemical and receptor. So it's... Uh, it would be something like a positive feedback loop. It enhances the reception of whatever receptors are ready for it. So it ups uh, serotonin. The opposite effect of an agonist is what's called an antagonist, which is a drug that binds to the receptor either on the primary site or on another site, which altogether stops the receptor from producing a response. So uh, you will... Of the psychedelics that we'll be covering, uh, they primarily work on serotonin and dopamine receptors. So functioning as an agonist of serotonin and an antagonist of dopamine. Um, and that's really what potentiates these sensory experiences. All right. So for this class, we will be talking um, about one, classic psychedelic in psilocybin, but these are serotonergic 5-HT2A agonists. So again, uh, bumping up the, the receptors for, uh, for serotonin that alter perception, cognition, and mood. So these are the psychedelic effects. So um, you're seeing already some of the words within definitions of other words, and that are currently controlled in Schedule 1 of the Controlled Substances Act, including LSD, psilocybin, DMT, and mescaline. So these are all plants. These are all naturally occurring substances that are all banned um, according to the Controlled Substances Act. Uh, so, and, and we can, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but if you look up the scheduling and the, um, requirements for the different scheduling of, uh, substances, it's crazy. <laughs> so it's like in terms of being a schedule one, for example, it states that it has no medical use, which is crazy. We've been building in this second wave of what, what is called kind of the renaissance of uh, psychedelic um, research, 
we, this has been happening for over 30 years. So yes, it's, it's become much more mainstream, much more popular. Um, like I said in my introductory video within the last five-ish, three to five years. Um, but this started in the 90s. Uh, MAPS was founded in the 80s. So it's been around. It's just now kind of catching some steam. All right. So psych psychotropic plant substances. These are plants that people ingest in the form of simple or complex preparations. They are usually taken orally, topically, inhaled. Um, yeah. Yeah, those would be the ways. In order to affect the mind or alter the state of consciousness, these plants were conceptualized as containing teachers, spirits, and even gods. Then we have psychoactive substances. These are substances that when taken in or administered into one system affect mental processes like perception, consciousness, cognition, or mood and emotions. And theogens, uh, which you will hear and theogen and hallucinogen and psychedelic in some ways um, interchangeably, but they're really not. Um, so an entheogen is an agent for producing an experience of engagement with the spirit world. So entheogens um, are really, uh, this is a term that is used it, within indigenous communities and indigenous cultures. Um, and a, a component of an entheogen is what's called animism. So this is where animals, plants, and even rocks, water, and wind are experienced as living sentient beings. Um, so I'll talk all about this in, within this presentation, um, but there's a really deep connection in indigenous cultures uh, in the Americas, as well as in Africa, um, of a connection to all things and a really strong spiritual connection to animals, um, recognizing that we're all part of the animal kingdom. Um, so that will be a theme this week in terms of what you learn. All right. So more definitions. Um, now moving into, you know, kind of some of the more anth entheogen um, related words. So we've got, we're reading all this week on shamans and shamanism. So this is a person regarded as having access to an influence in the world of good and evil spirits, especially among people in Northern Asia and North America. Typically such people enter a trance state during a ritual and practice divination and healing. They see themselves as having been selected from birth to be a healer. Um, so if anyone, well, so I'll talk about the training to become a shaman. Um, the people who are conducting the research for psychedelics are not shamans. Um, we do not consider ourselves chosen. Um, there is not a sacredness to what we do in terms of that title. Some of us do, uh, consider ourselves healers. Um, but just know the training to become a shaman, um, the lineage of shamanism, that's deep. Um, so if you get into this work, uh, you are a guide. You are not a shaman unless you've gone through the training. Okay. So shamanism is that practitioners deliberately induce altered states of consciousness, most often, but not always with psychedelic or psychoactive plants or fungi, and in the trance state are able to diagnose and treat illnesses, divine the future, retrieve lost souls, and otherwise carry out various functions to support the religious and spiritual life of their community. So one difference between a psychedelic guide, which I will talk about, actually, let me define this first. So psychedelic guides are individuals who oversee psychedelic therapy sessions as it is a broad encompassing term that applies the appropriate level of intervention somewhere between the overly active role of therapist and the inactive role of sitter. The word guide was also chosen because it allows for the inclusion of staff with a wide range of backgrounds as a truly multidisciplinary approach is required. So one of the key differences between, amongst other things, but among, between shamans and guides is that shamans are also under the influence of the psychedelic while they are in ritual. Um, and while they are in, while the, the person who was wanting to be healed, who was wanting to learn, you know, whatever brought them to ingesting the substance, the shaman is also ingesting that substance. Psychedelic guides do not do that. That was one of the problems we had in the first wave of like, how are you 
you know, impartial objective, you know, thinking about things from a research standpoint, um, if you are in a non-ordinary state of consciousness. Um, so that is one thing that psychedelic guides do not in the treatment or in whatever intervention, they are not under the influence of any sort of psychedelic. Um, so with just another thing that I'll say here. So um, guides function differently with different substances. So for example, psilocybin is a really internal experience for the patient participant client um, where they have, they're listening to music, they have eye shades um, and the guide is simply there to help keep the person grounded. Um, so we'll talk all about set setting and integration. Um, I hope I'm not getting too far ahead of myself. So with the uh, with psilocybin, they really are a sitter and a, I would say like a grounder, an anchor. Um, and then with MDMA, uh, so participants who are who are under the influence of psilocybin don't talk. It's really just meant to kind of be uh, this internal experience where you are really tuning into the wisdom of self. Um, Cause that's another thing with psychedelics is they it's, there's a belief that there is like an unlocking of individual wisdom. Um, and it's like, kind of like you have everything you need. Um, this is a tool for you to unlock some of that. And then with MDMA, you are more of a therapist. You are in a more active role uh, where you would be conducting some level of talk therapy while the person is under the influence of MDMA. Um, so MDMA has been used quite a lot with trauma. And so one of the things that it's helpful for is it you're in a very euphoric state under the influence of MDMA. Um, so when you talk about trauma, you're not um, triggered, you're not reactivated. Um, you don't necessarily have flashbacks because you're in an altered state of mind. So it allows for the person to talk about it without having some of those uh, really distressing, uncomfortable, traumatic um, repercussions in many ways of doing this. So with MDMA, there's also um, research working with couples where uh, one person maybe is struggling with PTSD because with the testing of uh, psychedelics, there generally has to be a diagnosis. Um, so just just know that they're meant to be created for indications. So, you know, uh, an indication of psilocybin is for addiction. Um, and so with couples, uh, there would be both partners taking MDMA so that the partner who hasn't um, experienced the trauma isn't vicariously traumatized from hearing their partner's trauma that maybe they haven't heard um, before. So um, again, yeah. So plant medicine, this is again used uh, primarily, this language is used primarily in indigenous cultures. Um, it's a type of medicine that uses roots, stems, leaves, flowers, or seeds of plants to improve health, prevent disease, and treat illness or the plants that possess therapeutic properties or exert ben uh, beneficial pharmacological effects on the human or animal body. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the indigenous roots. Like I said in my introductory um, video, not all psychedelics are plants. Um, not all psychedelics have indigenous roots. Some psychedelics were created in labs in um, Switzerland, in Germany. Um, we'll be learning a little bit more about that as well. So, uh, but as you know, the unfortunate but very real history when indigenous and Western cultures collide. Um, Western cultures tend to uh, warp uh, what, what was meant by uh, and created by indigenous people. So indigenous roots and practices involving hallucinogens were distorted by Western values, Christianity and colonization. So as we read, you know, there was this in many ways like this vilifying or demonization of hallucinogens. Um, they were seen as very scary and barbaric. Um, and so the sacredness of the use and the healing power um, were not honored at all. Um, so that very much informs where we are today. I mean, the Controlled Substance Act is absurd, but I'll, I'll just say that a few times throughout the next 10 weeks. So anthropology has been important, providing 
perspectives for understanding hallucinogens through ethnographic, cross-cultural, and biological approaches that have identified the diverse roles these substances have played across cultures and over time. So when we think about uh, hallucinogens, yeah, it's been, um, you know, there's been medical applications in terms, of, you know, there's testing right now that's happening, for example, with fibromyalgia. As we know, it's been applied to various DSM diagnoses. Um, so we think about that stuff in terms of psychology um, or medicine, uh, but anthropology and sociology are super important in the understanding of psychedelics and hallucinogens and then theogens. Um, so I encourage you if, and I'll, what I can do throughout this semester as well is give you some resources for better understanding where some of this stuff comes from, um, because I, I'll do my best in 10 weeks. I can't teach you everything, but I do want to give you a foundation for curiosity. So anthropology's cross-cultural and biological approaches provide an understanding of the biological basis of the cross-cultural similarities and shamanic healing practices and how they relate to psychedelics and their effects on our evolved social psychology. So really what this is saying is hallucinogens have been in human history before written history, documented history. Um, we have tens of thousands, however, whatever you believe, <laughs> we have tens of thousands of years of experience with this. Um, and quite frankly, psychedelic like plants, they follow human evolution in terms of the, the movement of humans, psychedelic plants follow, um, psychotropic substances follow. Um, so there, there's a, an intertwining of the history. So shamanism, there are universal features of it. So uh, again, it's not necessarily culturally specific. There are features that um, are existing in shamanism around the world. So there is an alteration of consciousness. That's what we call non-ordinary states. Um, the element of healing, it is meant, it was, it's meant to heal various, again, we talk about it in terms of like mental health a lot of times, um, but there's all kinds of healing. We'll talk a little bit about um, susto and dueño and um, other, other applications in different cultures. Uh, engagement with animistic and an engagement with the animistic world. So again, the, the belief that we are one, yes, humans are part of the animal kingdom. We have an inherent and intimate connection with the animal world, uh, according to shamanism. So shamanic practices and beliefs are directly related to the principal neurological effects of psychedelics. So taking some of the history and bringing it in to some of the science um, and Western view today of a neurophenomenological relationship in which the phenomenological aspects of experience are directly related to the effects of psychedelics on brain operations and functions. So is there a spiritual component? Absolutely. Is there also a neurological component that we are trying to understand through fMRIs and EKGs and CT scans? Absolutely. So connections between shamanism and the biological effects of hallucinogens, like I was just alluding to here. So the animistic worldview is embraces the idea that spirits are a fundamental aspect of reality, that we have multiple worlds existing in many ways, multiple realms existing. And psychedelics in some ways are a key to some of those different realms. There's an engagement in one's identity and relationship to an animal. So again, animism, huge with entheogens. A spiritual trans transformation is manifested in a death and rebirth experience. We call this in psychedelic research, ego death. Um, and it's a key component of the helpfulness, the powerfulness, the meaningfulness of a psychedelic experience. It is also, for any of you who have maybe used recreationally at a concert or at a party or in a space that maybe wasn't very calm or you weren't you weren't in necessarily the best headspace um, coming into that, these are also terrifying experiences that would constitute what we talk about in psychedelics as a bad trip. 
So a bad trip ultimately is you not having a good headspace or a good environment that you've taken this a substance in and you freak out for a few hours um, or what maybe feels like a few hours because you lose a sense of time and space under the influence of psychedelics. Um, but it's not that these don't happen in um, you know more controlled settings. It's that um, the people who are with you know how to deal with it. Um, so I mean, it's it's in some ways similar to, you know, if you share your trauma with someone and they say, you know, you, you don't have to think about it that way. And you're just like, man, I shouldn't have said this to any, to you. Cause I don't feel any better. Um, in some ways it's, it's similar to that. And then there's an awareness of one's own soul or spirit exemplified by an out-of-body experience. Many people who utilize psychedelics will talk about feeling as though they are like floating above their body and seeing their body in a different way, or even potentially seeing another version of their body. We had a participant in our study in Alabama talk about how she had a conversation with her 16 year old self. Um, and 16 was really meaningful for her. Cause I think uh, these were times where she had some pretty traumatic experiences. So as a 40 something year old woman, she was able to physically see and talk with her 16 year old self and say, like, you're going to be okay. And I know you're doing the best that you can. Um, cause there was a lot of shame around some of the decisions and some of the just things that happened while she was at that age. All right. So some takeaways from this week's readings, um, shamanic perspective. So again, I, I want you to have a grounding in the foundation of, of this field. Um, and, and not, not remove the sacredness, the ritualistic, uh, values, the traditions around, um, psychedelics and any sort of plant medicines and theogens, um, that shamanic perspectives can provide guidelines for their therapeutic application. So we'll talk a lot about what these perspectives are and what these practices are. So shamanic practices for using hallucinogens can provide guidelines for modern therapeutic applications. So one of the fears of um, individuals in this field who have been conducting the research is that this is going to be just another commercialized treatment. And it's going to, you're going to pop a pill in a clinic you're going to have your experience and you are going to treat it like an um, uh, antidepressant, you know, just like we would have, we'll check in with you and see how you're doing. Um, even though paradigmatically it is completely different, um, <clears throat> in terms of, you know, antidepressants, for example, you have to take every single day, a psychedelic, you may only need one, um, experience with that in your whole life or, you know, a handful throughout your life, um, and, and have similar effects. Um, so there's a fear of some of the commercialization, you know, this, this may be attempt to, you know, try to reduce the cost of the human capital in this and just focus on the medication, but honestly, or the substance, but honestly, what we're finding in the research is that the human element of this is integral, which there's a part of me that, you know, thinks about indigenous people who have been practicing this for tens of thousands of years who would just kind of laugh at that and be like, yeah, we've known this, <laughs> you know? So it's, um, we, you know, in the, in the Western world, we gotta, we're always a little behind. Okay. So psychedelics and humans, e humans evolved echo psychology. So there is a long-term evolutionary relationship between humans and psychotropic plant substances, as I said, that reflects their selective effects in our evolution. So again, wherever you find humans, you find psychotropic plants and vice versa. There's a history of health benefits of ingesting psychoactive substances. You can definitely read about these. Psychedelics have deep evolutionary roots in the human's evolved eco-psychology. So basically who we are today as a people, as a species, is intimately involved in our understanding of cells from generations and generations and generations ago. Um, so through our relationship with our nervous system, so, you know, there's psychedelics have made an effect on that. Um, so there's, a, there's a stamp in us as a, as a human species, um, that psychedelics have left and their effects on personal awareness, social and environment relations and consciousness. So 
the way we understand ourselves today is informed by our history with psychedelics and psychotropic plant substances. Humans have a long history of foraging for food and needing to distinguish the mushrooms, for example, that were poisonous or via a viable food source or that potentiated a psychedelic experience. So I tried to do a little bit of digging for y'all to see if I could find like a video. Um, but I just, I can't help but think about that first person, maybe in their tribe, in their community, in you know, whatever setting that they were that took a psilocybe mushroom and was like, y'all, I am tripping. Um, so I'm, I just always think about that of what, you know, people had to die when they ingested mushrooms that were poison and then they just tripped. Um, because unlike synthesized versions of psychedelics, so like uh, MDMA and psilocybin, for example, can be taken in a pill form because it, it really controls the amount of psilocin. Oh, well, actually it's psilocybin, but then your body makes it. Once you ingest psilocybin, for example, your body creates psilocin, um, which is what creates the sensory experiences. Um, but it's very controlled. And you, if you were to pluck a psil psilocybe mushroom from the earth, there's really no way to know how concentrated that is. Um, so I just think about that too, of, you know, no two mushrooms have the same amount of psil psilocybe in them. Um, so you could have very different experiences depending on which ones you eat. Um, and then there's a sh the shamanic echo psychology. So, you know, we have a history with uh, psychedelics and then uh, with shamans as well. So shamans conceptualize psychedelic plants as embodying, embodying sentient beings with intelligence and purpose. So the way that you tap into um, these sentient beings with intelligence and purpose is through being in a non-ordinary state of consciousness. Psychedelics affect serotonin and dopamine neurotransmitter systems, like I said, for example, enhanced serotonergic uh, activations and secondary dopamine release. So the effects of psychedelics on these neurotransmitter systems have been found to create... So you can see these are some of the key aspects to mental health healing, a worldview of interconnectedness. So we operate in the Western world in what is called a hedonic culture. You get something, you want more of it. It's almost the, the kind of um, analogy for this or the symbolism of this is a, uh, being on a hamster wheel. You're always going to be chasing something else. Um, if I got a raise, now I want more money. I got a promotion. Now I want another promotion. I got this. I acquired these things. Now I want to acquire more things. Those are hedonic pleasures. And what the, what the hope is with psychedelics and what they can potentiate is what's called a eudaimonic pleasure, which is just a deep sense of gratitude and awe for what you do have. Um, so that's why, for example, psychedelics many times are taken in nature because I'm just a mad, you know, you, the Grand Canyon, for example, so vast when you go up to the redwoods, holy moly, like this is nature. Um, and then imagine being in a more of a eudaimonic space of just a deep sense of gratitude for what you have. Um, so there's connections too with some, um, meditation practices as well. So social orientation to altruism, uh, you know, wanting to serve one another, wanting to be of service, wanting to help one another. Um, but I'll go back to interconnectedness as well, because uh, a lot of our, our society is me, 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 right? What's in it for me? What's in it for me? Um, and you see others as competition. So with psychedelics, it is a connectedness to your fellow human being and also your fellow animal kingdom. There's a sense of cooperation and enhanced bonding. So imagine, you know, for example, with MDMA, working with couples um, and sharing that. I know some people will, you know, take MDMA or ecstasy or Molly um, in order for enhanced, you know, sexual pleasure. Um, but what you also find is that can be pretty shallow and not very long lasting. So imagine having this like very deep, connected, honest conversation intimate conversation with a partner and how that might really enhance your sense of bonding to one another. Reductions in defensiveness, fear, and anxiety. 
three of the driving forces of the current um, human psyche. Um, and there's an enhanced visual representation system that's that promotes cognitive integration. We'll talk, I'm gonna talk much more at length about that in, later in this uh, PowerPoint. Then there's a connection and identity with nature and a sense of spirituality. So psychedelics, emotional effects on in human adaptation. I'm going to talk specifically about psilocybin and L LSD. Okay, so with psilocybin, this produces biases toward positive emotions and social relations and reduces threat responses by shifting emotional biases to positive evaluations by decreasing visual threat processing. Um, so I just think about in, in some ways the like political climate that we are living in in terms of just a deep skepticism for our fellow human. Um, and psilocybin really works the complete opposite way. It's it's giving the benefit of the doubt to your fellow human. Um, so it's just, it's in many ways, really a rebellion against the current climate of humans. It reduces reactions of the amygdala. So the amygdala is our, where, what is very activated in our trauma, any trauma responses, in tuning of visual regions to threats, shifting emotional processing toward positive balance, decreasing top-down connectivity, meaning from the prefrontal cortex to the mammalian brain or to the limbic system. Um, there's a region, there's regions of the brain called the default mode network. So they're like mutually affected by one another instead of having the prefrontal cortex be fully in uh, control kind of of the limbic system. That's not exactly how the brain works because the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex both definitely have the their, where they shine and where you know, their purpose. Um, but in many ways it is a top-down connectivity. So this is involved in visual threat processing and shifting emotional biases away from negative interpretations. This produces a spectrum of experiences, like a direct experience of a supernatural world of spirits and mythical entities an experience of the separation of one's soul or spirit from the body and its travel to the supernatural world. So in many ways, this is kind of the shell that we exist in, but we are spirits, we are souls within our bones and our flesh and our water. Um, so th that's what it really highlights is one soul, one spirit, a death of the ego and its rebirth. So when we think about ego, um, it's, it's not, it's not Freudian's understanding of ego. It is ego in terms of a self-centeredness of an inflated sense of importance. Um, but ego also is kind of in some ways an understanding of self. So I literally imagine like, well, we, I've had part, we've had participants in our studies say that they watch themselves like melt into a liquid and then be reformed, um, or that they temporarily turned into an animal, um, and then came back as uh, their self, but completely changed. So it's in some ways, like I think about it as a like snake shedding old skin um, of really kind of functioning in a different way. Uh, information manifested in visions, highly um, visual in terms of uh, what we experience under the um, effects of psychedelics. It powers activated, there are powers activated and outside of the person, including the incorporation of spirits into one's body, um, relationships with animals that provide a, a source of power and then experiences of transformation into an animal. Then with LSD, there's a similar dynamic to psilocybin and its acute effects on emotional processing, impairing recognition of sad and fearful faces while increasing feelings of happiness and trust, closeness to others, emotional empathy, and a desire to be with others and pro-social behavior. So just so all of you know, LSD was really the main substance that was tested and used in research in the 50s and 60s. Um, LSD really isn't used as much anymore. Like I said, it's primarily psilocybin, MDMA, and ketamine. Um, and I'm not, I'm not fully sure why necessarily, um, but I just think that LSD has a little bit of a bad rap. So I think that there are probably researchers that are just a little bit scared to touch it and the political uh, risk that it might have or vulnerability maybe. So shamanism as a cross-cultural complex, the common patterns of behavior and belief 
um, which we call shamanism, were virtually universal in foraging societies, but declined, transformed, and disappeared under the effects of agriculture transformation and political developments that eliminated the cultures with egalitarian foraging lifestyles that supported shamanic activities. So, um, you know, this was, it was, it was predominantly practiced, um, but with the shift of industry and the way the world operates and globalization, um, it shifted. So biogenetic shaman, shamanic paradigms, the shaman's presence as a preeminent social leader with a central role in the group's political life, as well as spiritual and healing activities. So the shaman was seen as the leader of the group, the leader of the community, a a wise human um, that had connection to realms that not everybody has. Um, a shaman's role as the leader of the community wide nighttime ritual performance included the shaman's charismatic enactment of an encounter with the spirit world. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about this in terms of the timing of rituals. They were done um, at nighttime to to correlate with dreamlike states. So if you think about, you know, when do you have, I mean, it, it, maybe if you're different from me, I'm not, my daydreams aren't necessarily very vivid, but man, my dreams at night, the ability for my brain to access some other visual realm at night under zero influence of any substances, um, that's what was trying to be replicated in these nighttime ceremonies. The ritual production of a dramatic alteration of consciousness interpreted as an engagement with an entry into the spirit world. So again, these are the sh shamans were under the influence. And then as they were conducting um, their uh, ceremonies, that is what the um, participants in that were able to access as well. The alteration of consciousness through physical austerity, such as fasting, water deprivation, avoidances of specific food and spe sexual abstinence, and ritual drivers based in activities such as extensive drumming, prolonged dancing, individual and collective chanting and singing, and frequently through the use of psychedelics and other vision producing plants. So this is uh, what the preparation was for the shaman before rituals. They would fast, they would abstain from sex and their training, um, they would abstain for years because the belief is that there's a, um, a physical effect of any sort of, you know, sexual release and play in, in like an orgasm or something like that. But also there is a purity culture in this of if that the spirits were more favorable toward sexually abstinent or more quote unquote pure shamans or pure participants. Um, and then the drumming is in many ways replicated in uh, psychedelic research today with different um, playlists that are used in the, in the research, but also with uh, not taking specific foods. Um, so for those of you who might not know, uh, psychedelics, as we know, work primarily on serotonin receptors and the majority of your serotonin receptors are actually in your gut. Um, so if you eat like a heavy fat meal the night before you had your, um, like a drug administration, it would, it would dampen the effects of the psychedelic. Um, or really delay the effects of the psychedelic. So in our study in Alabama, we gave a list of basically like approved foods and had to really be clear with our participants about what was considered fat um, and what they should stay away from. Um, so that the lack of food in the gut really helps to keep it like clear of any potential dampening effects. So it really enhances, or the, the goal is to have as enhanced of a uh, effect of the serotonin receptors from the psychedelics. So a specific alteration of consciousness is conceptualized as flight, similar to modern astral projection, out of body and near death experiences in which the shaman, while in a period of physical collapse and appearing unconscious, 
is experiencing an entry into the spirit world. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about shamanic flight in a few slides, um, but it is, it's this like kind of taking off into the spirit world and being able to engage in that way. Well, being like appearing unconscious is it be essentially being in a deep trans, trance like state. An engagement with ritual activities of healing focused on divining the cause of illness and treating conditions attributed to soul loss. So in some cultures, you know, uh, some illness is believed to ha be, have um, influenced by some, you know, demon demons or something that has harmed your soul that has hurt your soul whereas we know in western it's mostly like what's going on with the neurology in your brain you know is is everything functioning in the way it is um very different in terms of um more indigenous and eastern conceptualizations of illness um and the extraction of internal objects sent by sorcerers to cause illness and death and the removal of the negative spirit influences so for anybody who may not be uh, familiar ayahuasca is a, a plant that is made into a drink um and when you drink it it uh causes somebody to throw up and the belief is that they are expelling the the sorcerers the cause of illness so it's not only a spiritual cleansing but it is a physical cleansing as well so the goal when ingesting ayahuasca for example is to throw up to cleanse the body of those negative um, influences there's a selection for the position through special encounters with spirits in the forest hallucinations illness and special dreams so that's kind of like part of the assessment of, you know, how, how do you, or how are you chosen? How are, how is it proven that you've been chosen to be in this position? Uh, there's a period of training involving austerities and prolonged periods of solitude in the wilderness, often characterized as a vision quest that involved a visual encounter with spiritual entities that empowered the shaman. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure if, if this is like a, a parallel, but I think it could be um, similar to like the, like training to become a monk. Um, obviously there's different nuances, but that might be some, something that's a little bit more familiar to y'all. Typically there's the use of special plants, particularly entheogens, emetics and various power plants thought to provide teachings from their inherent spirit beings. So again, there's a lot of ingesting of these psychoactive plants, these psychoactive substances in order to become as attuned to and learn as much. Cause remember when you're in the state, that's when you get the intelligence, the wisdom, not the intelligence it's wisdom. Um, and so the, when you're under the influence, it's only more wisdom. There's the initiatory experience involving the experience of personal death involving being attacked, killed, or devoured by animals. So in the state, there's visions, there's hallucinations, there's what we would say sensory delusions of watching yourself die only to be reborn as some higher version, some more transcended version of self. A rebirth experience then is initiated by and as you are reconstructed by animals that incorporated their powers into the new person so you could use their ability. So for example, if you were eaten by lions, then there's there are in, innate beliefs around the powers of those lions. So if you're eaten by a lion and then you're reconstructed with that lion's like energy and wisdom within you, that gives you powers that you didn't have prior to your experience because you essentially kind of absorb all of those from the animals that you see in your uh, sensory experience. The source of shamanic power derives from special relations with animals, shamanic ability to use relations with animals, spirits to divine, heal, and kill, uh, the ability of the shaman to experience a personal transformation into an animal. So you can see very clear connections between the human and animal world. And the belief and practices concerning the shaman's ability to cause harm to others and kill them magically through inter intrusive uh, darts or soul theft. So in some ways, it's something that could be taken advantage of. Um, so it, these are powers that have to be honored and, and not abused. And then there's other special abilities, including immunity to fire and power to control the weather and animals. So larger ecological um, influences here. 
So hallucinogens from a shamanic perspective, plants are understood as sources of visionary inspiration and novel information. And as entheogens, substances that stimulate inherent spiritual properties. So you're hopefully getting the gist here of how hallucinogens are conceptualized. The concept of hallucinogen, it implies false perceptions and distortions of reality. This contradicts the basis of the shamanic engagement with these visionary experiences as accessing a superordinate reality. So we talk about hallucinations as though it is a departure from reality, where the way that hallucinogens are conceptualized from a shamanic perspective is that this is an enhancement of reality. This is an accessing of a reality that we as humans are limited to not be able to see or experience when we are not under the influence of psychedelics. So it's seen as an enhancement. Um, it's not seen as a distortion. It's not seen as a delusion. So there, there is... So just being aware of when you when you talk about it in terms of a departure from reality, um, that that is absolutely not the conceptualization of everyone. The shamanic engagement with vision producing substances of the plant world was conceptualized as an engagement with the spiritual world revealed in the visionary experiences. So, I mean, I hope I, I hope this doesn't sound disrespectful in any way to shamans. Um, I think in some ways this can be. Uh, compared to not exactly um but what we conceptualize as mediums like that they have a an ability to in, uh, engage with the spiritual world that not everybody does um and i know that that statement might be controversial because i know that some people think that mediums are absolute scams um but i i that is uh, like I think in terms of the conceptualization of abilities, I think those can be uh, compared-ish in some ways. So spirit world visions and engagement with spiritual beings are central to shamanism and the entheogens are powerful tools for inducing these experiences. So again, this is not, shamans do this under the influence of psychedelics and entheogens. This, the ritual performance during the darkness of night with an eyes closed internal focus of attention facilitate the engagement with visionary experiences. This is replicated in research today. Eye shades, music, very internal experience. The guide, the psychedelic guys stays out of the way. We're not asking, how are you doing? What's going on? Share with me what's going on. No, I'm going to give you six hours to just be with yourself. Um, just so you know, active periods. So psilocybin has about a six hour active period. MDMA has about an eight hour active period and ketamine has about a 30 minute to 60 minute active period. Um, this is seen as plant deities and are viewed as having intrinsic spiritual properties and a sentient intelligence, meaning the plants do. All right. So animism, you could also call this anthropomorphization, uh, like giving human qualities to animals. So the animistic tendency expands on our basic propensity for detection of inanimate entities with a special capacity for engaging animals, reflecting what evolutionary psychologists have identified as an innate natural intelligence of humans for recognizing species essences and categorizing these uh categorizing these species of animals. Uh, I think I say this in multiple slides, unfortunately. Well, it's okay. It's, it's all right. Um, but that takes me down here to, you know, our capacities for recognizing animal species with their variant qualities were the natural framework for creating symbols for elaborating psychological and social identity. So we do this type of symbolism in sand tray and play therapy. Um, and I'm, yeah, even thinking about different kinds of therapy that we use today of um, family mapping with animals. Like, uh, I just think about like, sometimes I, I talk about my dad as like an ostrich or a turtle because they like go into their shell or put their head in the sand when they're, um, you know, kind of threatened. Um, so we give traits to animals um, so when you see yourself in that, like having some kind of like metaphorical meaning, um, that's that's the connection between humans and animals. All right, so animism with contemporary psychology. So where does it show up today? 
Animistic dynamic is manifested in shamanic concepts such as guardian spirits, which serve as sources of power for the shaman and represent personal and social identity and other psychodynamic processes like um, the id, ego, and superego and self in um, psychodynamic processes, as well as the concepts of self, exiles, managers, and firefighters in internal family systems or IFS. And then, like I said in the last one, um, these also show up in play therapy and Santry therapy. Uh, so we are carrying some of these concepts probably without really understanding the roots. So shamanic training, how do you become a shaman? Training often involved repeated ingestion of large amount of psychedelic plants while maintaining a strict diet that is to enhance um, the effects of the psychedelic, uh, the psychedelics trainees may ingest entheogens repeatedly over a period of months or even years as part of training and developing their personal power. So it's thought of as a skill, you know, you, you practice something, um, in order to hone it. So this is no different. This prolonged ingestion is seen as a necessary tool for entering the spirit world and key aspects of the effects of entheogens involve the manifestations of the plant teachers who represented the spirits of plants providing specific forms of knowledge and power. So in many ways, it, this was thought to connect to your own lineage lineage of shamanic powers. Um, so not only do the, are the plants teaching, but you're also connecting to anything else in your lineage, like other people, other animals um, that can help um, enhance your wisdom. So some therapeutic uses of hallucinogen. So uh, these like mescaline is basically the um, active ingredient in peyote. So peyote is considered, uh, peyote you generally smoke. Um, so this is considered to have general healing properties and cleansing the stomach, kidneys, liver, and blood. So from a historical standpoint, so peyote was used for curing, protecting against witches and ghosts, maintaining good health and mind, incentives to work, release from guilt, temperance from alcohol, transcendence, overcoming misfortunes, guidance in future good fortune, um, accessing knowledge, foretelling future and motivation. It gives purpose to life and internal peace. So it's believed to have all of these powers. And then also another cactus, the San Pedro cactus that also contains mescaline or mescaline, people say it differently, used to solve many problems such as witchcraft and hexes. So you can see that spiritual realm, these curses, that's a, a cleansing. So these rituals serve as means for integrating the ancient ancestral traditions into current adaptations through manipulation of aspects of the subconscious mind. So you're connecting to uh, these aspects of your mind that you wouldn't normally have access to. Then snuffs, so these are employed for a variety of physical problems, especially stomach and bladder problems, malaria, worms, hemorrhoid, mouth sores. So you can see all of the medical apps application of this. Um, this also had broader social functions when employed in intervillage feasts, focusing on building and solidifying alliances, that interconnectedness that have been noted to provoke a release of information and strains or the release from the emotions and strains of everyday life and to stimulate um, uh, antisocial behavior, including personal violence and homicide. So um, psychedelics have been used to prep for war, um, to have more of a openness to killing your fellow human as well. So there has been preparation for combat. So it's not all peace, love and all that stuff. Um, so then ayahuasca used in divinatory and healing ceremonies. So you can see here, there was ritual functions in establishing individual intervillage relations, helping in learning myths, art, chants, and dances. So this bonding, not only to others currently, but to, uh, to history and for obtaining guidance in life. It also used, it was also used to treat uh, a range of culture bound syndromes. We talk about these a little bit in the DSM, Susto, um, causing the loss of a person's soul, daño, caused by sorcery, envy or desire for vengeance and mal de ojo, which is evil eye. So there's, as you can see, culturally bound um, syndromes, diagnoses, whatever you wanna call them. Pro they wouldn't call them diagnoses, but we would. 
in Western medicine. So with psilocybin, there's a variety of shamanic, spiritual, and therapeutic applications similar to before of like spiritual hexes. But you can see here, it also helps with physical maladies like fever, toothache, pimples, pain, um, to address social problems and resolving quarrels. Um, so there was a sensationalistic early European reports of Aztec cults uses of mushrooms generally offered little more than gross descriptions, failing to understand the cultural reasons. So again, European perspectives like really um, skewed the, the beauty and sacredness um, and larger connection to the ecosystem. So the wisdom of the mushroom healers is not learned from humans, but is acquired directly from the mushroom when their force enters the healer's body and speaks directly to the person telling the source of the problem and what to do to resolve it. So that's a key in why shamans ingest the um, substances because it's part of the diagnostic process. You wouldn't be able to assess and diagnose without the wisdom of the plant. And then the powers of the mushrooms are thought to act through the shaman. So it's a, shamans are a vehicle to utilize the wisdom of the plants. So Maria Sabina, the OG, the wise woman, the Mazatec. Uh, so Sabina's use of language in not only singing and chanting, but also other kinds of utterances manifests a rhythmic quality to suggest that they function as procedures for altering consciousness and enhancing the healer's self-presentation as they unfold a dialogue in which she would associate herself with both indigenous and Christian supernatural figures. So some of the coming together of the worlds and for lack of a better term. So these associations along with the explicit content of the chants reveal their therapeutic role in enhancing the patient's belief in the healer's power. So there's a, a bit of a show, um, but not like a performance. It's a demonstration, I guess I should say, encouraging positive expectations and pursuing cathartic experiences. So here, um, this is what we talk about in terms of set with research now is, do you trust me? You're gonna be in an, a vulnerable state. Um, how can I demonstrate to you my integrity, my wisdom, my trustworthiness? Um, and in many ways, that's what this means here. So like I said, there's a connection to the music in terms of chanting set of the, you know, what kind of mindset are people going into um, before using psychedelics? It's important. And then setting in terms of what environment they're taking the medication in uh, or the substance in that's used in research today. So just linking some of the stuff to future um, teachings in this class. All right. So shamanic ritual procedures for managing consciousness. So set and setting. We talked a little, I alluded to this earlier and you read about this in terms of food restriction. Um, so there were uh, dietary restrictions prior to the ingestion of any entheogens to help reduce the frequent experience of nausea and a sense of blockage. So again, because the majority of your serotonin receptors are in your stomach, um, in your intestines, um, Nausea is just a, a part of the ride. Um, and that's where mindset comes in. So there's more of a diving into the nausea instead of being afraid of it and wanting to run from it. So uh, yeah, permit enhanced absorption in the mostly empty intestine. So you want the absorption to be as much as possible through having more of an empty stomach. So sexual abstinence, like I said before, there's lengthy and frequent periods of celibacy for shamans. They're often tied to concepts of purity and the belief that spirits are attracted to sexually abstinent people. And then celibacy also has physiological effects related to common physiological responses involved in sexual orgasm. So it could, um, it could reduce the induction of altered states of consciousness. So uh, basically meaning that uh, a sexual orgasm can uh, in, induce a altered state of consciousness. Um, so you wanna stay away from that so that the, so you wanna stay celibate so that the psychedelic is what does that. So it's, you, um, 
that you don't lessen the the power or the, yeah, I guess the power of that by having had uh, sexual relations. So drumming, singing, and chanting. So these songs are considered to have special moderating influences, enhancing the entheogens, guiding the shaman's divinatory perceptions, and activating the healing processes during the ritual. Uh, their songs are seen as evoking the therapeutic process. So you can see the human is so important in this process. Overnight rituals and dream time. So a key aspect of shamanic practice is the integration of natural dream cycles within a ritual period. So that's why they're done at night because we tend to sleep at night. By linking the entheogenic or entheogenic uh, experience into the functional capacities of dreaming and it's visually based represent presentational symbolism, shamanism can extend and integrate the functional effects of psychedelics with innate emotional and cognitive processes to enhance the power of altered states of consciousness. So in a dreamlike state, you're already kind of in an altered state of consciousness. So this is just kind of like fuel to the fire. So ASC is what we're going to call altered states of consciousness moving forward. So shamanic ASC is a typical feature was death and rebirth, like I've talked about, that involved being killed by animals, which dismembered and ate the initiate or the person and subsequently reconstructed their body, incorporating themselves with new powers. Another form of shamanic consciousness involved the personal experience of being transformed into an animal, experiencing the world through this animal from which they acquired power. So it was kind of like you were either eaten and absorbed or you transformed. So it's kind of like, what form did you absorb the powers of the animal. So there is a concept called, or an experience called shamanic flight, which is when shamans experience, it's an engagement with the spirits at various levels of reality. And they the journeys can also be seen in, as an engagement with various aspects of one unconscious, one's unconscious brain structures and processes. Um, so flight can literally mean what we understand about flight of being above and having a different viewpoint. Um, it can also just be kind of the taking off um, of when somebody is under the influence of psychedelics, there is a feeling of kind of taking off, um, not of having like a sense of um, distance from gravity. Uh, and then there's visionary experiences. This is the emergence of unconscious context, content, which provides the opportunity for transforming personal attachments and emotional traumas enhancing awareness and overall well-being of the transfer of information from the unconscious into the conscious. So we know all about repression. You know, we studied Freud's psych 101 stuff. Um, so this is ultimately because your brain connectivity under the influence of psychedelics is, is more <laughs> that these kind of protective parts of our brain that keep some of these more repressed um, or some of these memories that are more difficult traumatic experiences repressed, psychedelics bring them to the surface. So that is another reason why the mindset going into an experience is so important, that preparation is so important. Um, so the contact of content of the visionary experiences provides both content for diagnostic practices and then reflecting repressed energies unsolved conflicts and the development of dynamics and then the therapeutic processes which are manifested in connection to archetypal images. So you can see lots of connection here to psychodynamic approaches to our understanding of the human psyche. Psychedelics are powerful tools for eliciting these elements of the collective unconscious often rendered as entities from the spirit world that express and release the archetypal energy. Um, so remember, an archetype is a representation, it's a symbol. Um, sometimes they can be uh, neutral in terms of their effect. Sometimes they can be negative in terms of their effect. Uh, they're rarely positive. Um, so it, it's in some ways like a reframe of these archetypal energies. So when the, again, some that's an the in terms of the altered states of consciousness, the death and rebirth is one, and then animal transformation. So just giving you titles to some of these altered states of consciousness. So psycho psychedelic neurophenomenology. So there are phasic effects of psychedelic, meaning you are affected in phases. So they stimulate and enhance serotonin. 
They saturate and overload the serotonin system, and then they release the habitual serotonin repression of the dopaminergic system. So again, when serotonin is released, there is naturally, there is a little, there is a repression of the dopamine system and psychedelics are like, nope, let's have them both. Um, we're going to open them both up. And that's where there's so much activity happening in the brain, because it's almost like the neurotransmitters like take turns. Um, and if one is being, um, activated, the other one kind of stays a little bit more dormant and that's not what happens under the effects of psychedelics. So psychedelics compromise the serotonergic inhibition. So when ser serotonin inhibits the ascending flow of information and emotional processes or emotional responses resulting in the release of information from ancient levels of the brain, that's normally inhibited by serotonin regulation. So there's in some ways, there's, there's some research that talks about this as like a, a hyper activation, but it's more of a different type of activation. There's not hypo activation anywhere, or hyper activation. It is just, um, the, the neural patterns, the neural pathways are affected differently than when you're in an ordinary state of mind. Hallucinogens and many other agents and conditions produce hypersynchronous slow wave brain discharges in the serotogenic serotonergic <laughs> sorry circuits that link the hypothalamus and the limbic brain with a lower brain system. So again, we function mostly here. Um, but with psychedelics, it opens up pathways for the entire brain in many ways to be active. So primary process thinking, psychedelic disruption of the default mode network. So these are regions of the brain that results in an overall reduction of top-down brain control. So the instead of this um, prefrontal cortex being kind of in charge of the rest of the brain, it's more egalitarian. And there's a disruption in functional control that habitually is exercised by the frontal cortex. So in some ways it's kind of like, hey, take a break. Let's see what else is in here. And that's what is thought to activate some of these more um, unconscious experiences or realizations, memories, things like that. So in contrast, psychedelics increase functional connectivity among what would be normally segregated networks. So the default mode network is, a, is regions of the brain that are uh, all activated um, under the influence of psychedelics. So this produces a cross modular connectivity that provides more flexible communication across the brain. Um, I don't know if it says it here, but this is also what can create what's called synesthesia, where you might like smell colors, um, see tastes. Um, it's, so it's like this cross sensory experience, which is um, where you can see music. Um, so that is also what informs what's called the ineffability of a psychedelic experience. It's like, I don't, we don't have the language necessarily to describe what I just went through. Um, so gathering some of that qualitative uh, data can be kind of difficult because it's just, it having being ineffable is one of the qualities of a psychedelic experience. So this increased functional connectivity among normally disconnected brain networks reflects the integration of the somatic and emotional networks that manage primary forms of consciousness. And the loss of the top-down brain coherence resulting from the interruption of serotonin, Sarah, <laughs> this is going to happen all year, um, serotonergic modulation control and feedback loops combined with the increased neural excitability disrupts normal perceptual processes. So again, we're seeing, we're experiencing things that we've never experienced before. And these produce novel combinations of elements and information. I'm seeing, I'm experiencing my history in a different way. I'm experiencing my understanding of this in a different way. This is a paradigm shift for me because I'm Parts of my brain that don't normally talk to one another are talking to one another. So this is very scientific in the way that I'm talking about it now. You can see more of this like Western influence. So I'm inviting you to think a little bit about what could be some parallels 
between this way of thinking that I'm talking about right now with these process thinkings and some of the wisdom of the plants uh, in terms of shamanism. So there's the disruption of ordinary sensory binding, which creates a disordered and fluid state that results in novel cognitive combinations. So, you know, again, parts of the brain firing and talking to one another that normally wouldn't. Um, this is also thought to be one of the reasons why this is so helpful in addiction, because as we know, when we use a substance or when we engage in some process addiction, um, we really ingrain the way our brain talks to itself. Um, so psychedelics can open up pathways, um, for different routes. And so for a different understanding of the reason for the addiction, the reason for the use of the substance or the engagement in the behavior. Um, so it's pretty cool. Altering the brain's ordinary routines results in a greater randomization of brain activity, allowing for spontaneous synaptic plasticity. So a lot of the conversation with psychedelics is around neuroplasticity, um, which is really important. Um, that helps uh, what we're understanding and what we're learning is that helps um, guard against things like dementia, like Alzheimer's. Um, so there's research going into that as well. And it can help reshape network connectivity and enhance overall neural coordination and keep the brain quote unquote kind of young. So presentational symbolism of visual epistemology. The visual experiences of shamanism are manifestations of a capacity for presentational symbolism. So what is being presented to us in, in the form of symbolism, which is an ancient modality of cognition that emerged, that engages forms of meaning making that preceded our now dominant rational and language-based consciousness. So again, this is, is what I'm referring to when I talk about ineffability is we're seeing these things but so if you think about uh, mental health, right, it's rational. What what treatments do we use in mental health? Talk therapy. So this really offers different avenues in terms of healing, in terms of exploration of the human experience. And then presentational symbolism exhibits characteristics of complex synesthesia. Like I said, this is where your sensories kind of cross. Um you know, I'm, I'm hearing my hand, um, things like that in the integration of the various perceptual modalities and presented primarily through the visual system that manifests an internal flow of complex images. So just really going into this, this presentational symbolism is a big part of, uh, the psychedelic experience. And that is all I have for you this week, and I am trying to stop my share. <laughs> All right. Thank you.